This is the Evan Miller Report on Pundit Press Radio. Due to time-sensitive information from a delayed broadcast that aired the day before on SHR Media, some stories may be updated or irrelevant at this time. We hope you enjoy this broadcast of the Evan Miller Report on Pundit Press Radio from SHR Media. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. I'm Jason Miller. Tonight on the Evan Miller Report, the president of Yemen has resigned along with his prime minister in a protest at the Yes, whoever thought they could smuggle drugs from Mexico undetected with a drone without it crashing? Think again, I've got that story. A prominent New York lawmaker getting busted for corruption? Don't be so shocked, my New Yorker listeners. In business, Domino's Pizza is raising a stink with the Obama Amendment for how any restaurants can comply with the new Obama calorie count requirements. Boom, boom. McDonald's gets McSued over alleged McDiscrimination in McSuits across Mc... Oh, shut up, Mr. Evan. And guess who from American Idol Pass is gonna judge so you think you can dance? You'll find out in tonight's Evan Miller Report, your conservative news source, starting now. Live from Southern California, this is the Evan Miller Report. Jason Miller with News and Politics... Corey Evan with Business and Entertainment. This is the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media and Hundred Press Radio. Here now, Jason Miller. So good to be with you folks again. And what a hazy sunset we have here in SoCal. I read earlier this week in the weather report that was going to be clear this week, but I guess not. That's why we always leave 5% for the weathermen to be wrong here in the United States. Unfortunately. 5% of the time, they happen to be wrong. But welcome to the Evan Miller Report. We're glad you're with us on this Thursday. We have a lot of news to get to, a lot of developing stories we have. We have the Saudi king tonight, which we'll get to in just a moment. But first, we start off in Yemen, where the president of Yemen has resigned along with his prime minister in protest at the takeover of the capital, Sinai, by Shinya Hoth rebels, creating a dangerous political vacuum in that country. President Abdul Mansur Hadi said he could not continue after the Hoss failed to honor a peace deal. Parliament has reportedly refused to accept the resignations. Reports are coming in of explosions in the southern port of Aden, where President Hadi has a strong following. Hothi rebel figures publicly welcomed the resignation of the president with the one proposing the creation of a ruling council. The council would include Hoth-led groups. Abdi El Maliki Yusuf El Fishi was quoted as saying by the Reuters news agency and ITN. Hothi leaders had previously committed themselves to withdrawing from the key positions around the presidential palace and the home of the president, Haiti. The U.S., which is helping fight al Qaeda militants in Yemen, said it was still assessing the implications of President Haiti's move, despite rumors of the U.S. evacuating personnel from the U.S. embassy in Yemen. Meanwhile, local officials in Aden told Reuters and ITN that an, I, that an identified gunman 
had attacked two military vehicles in the city early on Friday local time in Yemen. Three explosions were heard during the attack which was followed by the clashes and one of the officials who declined to be identified. Explosions and clashes were also reported by Qatar's based broadcaster Al Jazeera and as Corey and I always like to call Al Jazeera here as we can say it together. Quality Arab, Arab, Arab television, television and death, death to America. To America as we always like to say here on this program. In his letter resignation seen by the Associated Press News Agency, Mr. Haiti said the parties had reached a deadlock. We found out that we are unable to achieve the goal for which we bear a lot of pain and disappointment, he said. A government source told the BBC that ministers were resigning in protest at the rebels' challenge to Yemen's sovereignty and their seizure of state institutions. In his resignation letter, President Min excuse me, Prime Minister Kelly Bashid said the cabinet did not want to be dragged in into an unconstructive political maze. Earlier this week, Hafti gunmen fired on Mr. Balney's convoy and then laid siege to the presidential palace where he was staying. Then on Wednesday, the home of President Haiti was shelled, shattering a ceasefire that had been agreed upon only hours earlier. Stay with the Evan Miller Report for the latest on what is going on in Yemen tonight. And we'll keep an eye on what is going on at the U.S. Embassy as well. Over to Japan now, where they say they are exploring every avenue to save two hostages who ISIS militants say they are holding. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihai Shoga said the government was trying to contact the hostage takers that it would not give in to terrorism. A video reportedly from ISIS released earlier this week demanded a ransom of $200 million within 72 hours. Tokyo, which lacks strong diplomatic ties in the area, believes the deadline expires at 14.50 or 5.50 GMT on Friday. We haven't been able to confirm the safety of the two Japans, Kodio News Agency quoted Mr. Shoga as saying. We are exploring every possible avenue to save their lives. He told the press conference, adding that the government had not heard directly from the group. The threat to kill the men was contained in a video shot in an unidentified desert and which has been it, not been independently verified. The video named the two men as Kinjay Goto, a well-known freelance journalist, and Hernana Yokwa, who reportedly went to Syria to set up a private, a private military contracting company. The ransom demanded by the militants is the same amount of money as they pledged in, as the Japanese government pledged a non-military aid for countries fighting ISIS by Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe during a tour of the Middle East this past Saturday. Officials said that much of the $200 million fund would be focused on helping refugees displaced by the conflict in Syria and in Iraq. Cabinet Secretary Shuga said on Thursday that the militants misunderstood Japan's position, saying, quote, we wish not to fight against the world of Islam. We want to help more than 10 million refugees in the region. This is humanitarian and non-military support. We want them to understand this and free the hostages immediately, he said. Well, folks, in my general opinion, I think those two hostages, and we've seen this in the past, Corey Evan, and I believe those two hostages are going to get killed, and the Japanese are not going to be getting those two back. Unfortunately, the precedent says you're right on this one, Jay. Mm, uh, quite an um, unfortunate story. Of course, stay with us and we'll keep you up to date on uh, what is going on over there. But at least that's my prediction of seeing previous situations. All right, moving on tonight to a developing story tonight out of the Middle East. Back to the Middle East as we have breaking news out of that region tonight. Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah died earlier er, Tonight, uh, uh, tonight, that's being Friday in Saudi Arabia, and his brother Salmin became king. The royal court in the world's top oil exporter and birthplace, birthplace to Islam, said in a statement carried on Saudi state television. King Salman has named his half brother Mur Murkran as his crown prince and heir. His Highness Salman bin Al Saudi and all members of the family in the nation mourn the custodian of the two holy mosques, King Abdullah bin Abshas, who passed away at exactly 1 a.m. this morning, they said in a statement. 
Abdullah thought to have been born in 1923, had ruled Saudi Arabia as king since 2006, but had run the country as de facto regent for a decade before that after his predecessor King Fahid suffered a debilitating stroke at the stake with the appointment of the Salman as king in the future direction of the United States' most important Arab ally and self-appointed champion of Sunni Islam in a moment of unprecedented turmoil across the Middle East. Abdullah played a guiding role in Saudi Arabia's support for Egypt's government after the military intervened in 2012 and drove his country's support for Syrians' rebellion against President Bashar al-Assad. King Salman, thought to be age 79, had been crown prince and defense minister since 2012. He was governor of Rihad province for five decades before that, by immediately appointing Magran as his heir, subject to the approval of a family alliance council, Salman has moved to avert widespread speculation about the immediate path of royal succession in the world's top oil explorer. Long-term challenges, uh, 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 Abdullah pushed cautious changes in the conservative Islamic kingdom, including increased women's rights and economic deregulation, but they made no moves towards democracy was a hawk on policy towards rival Iran. King Salman has been part of the ruling clique of princes for decades and is thought likely to continue the main thrust of Saudi strategic policy, including maintaining the alliance with the U.S. and working towards energy market stability. So stay with the Evan Miller Report. We'll keep you updated on the latest going on in Saudi Arabia tonight. But once again, just to let you know that the Saudi king, Abdullah, has died at 79. All right, over to Thailand now, where their army has st stacked parliament, will vote in an impeachment hearing against ousted Prime Minister Yingluk Shugrata on Friday. Tried to doing that and juggling a few drinks around. Whew, that was a tongue twister. Testing a fragile calm between the rural poor, poor, uh, poor and royalist establishment backed by the Bangkok middle class. A guilty verdict on the charge of deregulation of duty could see Yingluck, who was removed from office for abuse of power in May, days before a military coup, banned from politics for five years. Security near Parliament was tight on Thursday, with around 100 soldiers and police stationed around the building. There were no visible protests. The cha uh, charges against Yingluck, Thailand's first female prime minister, concern her role in a loss-making rice-buying scheme that helped bring her a landslide election victory back in 2011. Youngblood defended the scheme in an almost hour-long address on Thursday and disputed all charges against her. Banning me for five years will be a violation of my basic rights, Youngblood said at the third and final hearing on her case on Thursday at Thailand's National Legislative Assembly. This case is aimed solely against me as a hidden agenda. It's politically driven, she said. Youngblood said the rice scheme which paid farmers above the market rate for their rice was good for the economy. It helped those with lower incomes earn more. She said farmers are the backbone of the country. For Youngblood's opponents, the rice scheme was expensive, wasteful, and symbolic of the pol populist policies aimed at buying the rural vote. Yungluk supporters say the charges are part of a broader campaign by the ruling military junta known as the National Council for Peace and Order to limit the influence of her powerful family and her Puthai party. And we'll keep you up to date on that story as it develops as well here. Over to Nigeria now where Nigeria's National Security Advisor has urged the Electoral Commission to delay next month's elections to allow more time for voter card distribution. The polls are the first in Nigeria to require voters to have biometric cards. Nigeria, racked by a violent uprising by Islamist Boko Haram, is scheduled to hold elections on February the 14th. The security chief, Subdul Dasi, also said that the neighboring Chad was sending troops to help fight the militants who controlled many towns and villages, and he criticized cowards with the Nigeria's armed forces for hampering the campaign against the insurgents. Uh, two days of historic talks between the U.S. and Cuba have ended with both sides agreeing to meet again. The discussions had focused on restoring diplomatic relations, but no date was set for the reopening of embassies. 
A U.S. official said normalizing relations after decades of hostilities would take time. The Cuban delegation chief said lifting the economic blockade against Cuba was essential. Joseph Bindel said no date had been set for the next round of discussions. These were the highest level talks in decades between the U.S. and Cuba. The talks followed December's agreement by President Obama and his Cuban counter counterpart, Rural Castro, fellow communist, the head of the U.S. delegation assistant secretary of state for Western Hemisphere, Roberta Jacobson, said we have to overcome more than 50 years of a relationship that was not based on confidence or trust. Ms. Vendell, her Cuban counterpart, said it was a first meeting. This is progress. She said that she expected a new meeting to be scheduled in the coming weeks ahead of April summit of the Americas, which President Obama and President Castro are expected to attend. All right, folks, it is time for the latest in our continuing battle against global socialism. UN Human Rights Chief has called on Miramar to condemn a Buddhist nationalist monk who called a UN special envoy, wrote the word, the B word, which I'm not going to use the full language on this program, and the duck. jail for inciting anti-Muslim violence. The monk is a leader uh, of the 969 movement which says Miramar should remain a Buddhist country and calls for restrictions and boycotts on Muslims. Mr. Zahid called the language sexist and insulting. I call on the religious and political leaders in Miramar to unequivocally condemn all forms of incitement to hatred including this abhorrent public personal attack, Mr. Zahid said in a statement. Since the end of the military rule in Miramar, also known as Burma, in 2011, Buddhist nationalism, largely led by monks, including Withru, has been energized. In 2012, scores of people died and thousands of people were left homeless after violence broke out between the Buddhists and the Muslims in Rakhine State, mostly from the Rakhine minority. Anti-Muslim violence has flared several times since then. The UN says that the Rakhdi are being persecuted and last week passed a resolution calling on Myanmar to give them citizenship. And for more on tonight's continuing battle against global socialism, here's Corey Evans. Thank you, Jay. A bakery in Denver, Colorado is fighting a legal claim after it refused to inscribe a gay slur on a cake, according to ABC Chicago. Thousands of customers are coming to the defense of the Azucar Bakery in Denver. The owner says a customer came into her shop about a year ago asking to have the slur written on a Bible-shaped cake, but she says she had to draw the line. Marjorie Silva said she'd make the cake, but not write the message. The customer then canceled the order and filed a religious discrimination against the discrimination complaint against the bakery. Quote, we did feel it was not right for us to write hateful words or pictures about human beings, Silva said. People from across the world have sent messages in support of the owner's decision. A state agency will hear the case in March. Oh, for goodness sake. I mean, I understand if folks don't like homosexuals and want to stick it to them in some way, or shape, or form, saying that they're going to get the judgments of God in their own way. But to actually have a gay slur written on what looks like a Bible, that's just insultingly bad. Am I right or am I right, Jay? Yes, absolutely right. That's an uh, abomination to us all right there when, uh, when you're doing that. Not only, uh, uh, only are you insulting uh, people of other relig religious beliefs, such as Christians and Catholics, you are insulting people who want to use free speech as well. Right, but of course you have to draw the line somewhere. So, will the rights of business owners prevail? 
When will the liberals just accept that cake decorators don't have to write mean things on cakes if they don't wanna? And when will my a weather app stop taking its data from Dallas Ravens? Stay tuned for developments in our continuing battle against global socialism. Now, what do you have against Dallas Reigns? Is well, he Dallas? works. Well, he works at ABC Los Angeles, which historically, Jay, we've noticed that at least in Hammett, California's case, they tend to get it wrong. Hmm. That's the only yeah. point I'm making. So the temperature's always off by 20 degrees towards Dallas. Exactly. Hmm. All right, folks, on that note, while we leave you rubbing your heads and saying, okay, what's the joke? <laughs> We're going to go ahead and take a break at this time. When we come back, President Obama will not be meeting Benjamin Netanyahu when Netanyahu comes speaks to a joint the session of Congress. We'll tell you why. Yes, ECB President Mario Draghi is going big and likely going home for tea time afterwards. Dollar General is reaffirming their top officials and their attempts to acquire Family Dollar. And Domino's drops an honest word against the new Obamacare calorie count. Maybe way to knock them over, Domino's. All that and more, plus McDonald's gets mixed sued in lawsuits across America. All that and more coming up in the Evan Miller Report. You're listening to SHR Media. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media and Hunted Press Radio. to the SHR Media Network. How you doing? John Grant here. When I'm not slaving over a hot microphone on the 405radio.com Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, I check out Sean and Clint here at Sackheads Radio. We all appreciate the best political bloggers, writers, and commentators. We either get them on our shows or we make fun of them, as it should be. So check us out live Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern or forever on the podcasts on the 405radio.com. This is Tammy Jackson inviting you to join me on the Tammy Jackson Show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific on the 405radio.com. Put down that remote and tune into the show that covers politics, Guns in the Second Amendment, Religious Liberty, Sanctity of Life, the Military, and more. I host newsworthy guests and work hard to be a conservative radio show that's not like all the others. So stay Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific for me, Tammy Jackson, on the 405 mediacom Hello, I'm Paul, a student at Hillsdale College. Here is my professor, Dr. Larry Arn, on the separation of church and state. America's founders believed in the separation of church and state, in that the country was not to have an official religion or an official sect. But that did not mean that government was to be hostile to religion, or even indifferent to religion, as many today argue. In fact, America's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, includes both a reference to God as the author of the laws of nature, and a confident assertion that human beings are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Far from being hostile or indifferent to religion, America's founders understood the theology of the Declaration to be an essential part of the education of citizens. This Constitution Minute was brought to you by Hillsdale College. To join the national conversation on the Constitution, go to constitutionminute.org. Hi, this is Rooster from Outcry Radio. Catch me here on Blog Talk Radio every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or follow my blog. Now back. 
Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. At St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, our discoveries have helped drive the childhood cancer survival rate from 20% to 80%. And we share our research all across America. I'm 80% sure I'll spoil my kids. I'm 80% sure I'll break boys' hearts. I'm 80% sure we're chick magnets. 80%? I'll take those odds. <laughs> give thanks for the healthy kids in your life and give to those who are not. Go to stjude.org or shop wherever you see the St. Jude logo. Let's get back to the Edmund Miller Report on SHR Media and Pundit Press Radio. And welcome back to the Evan Miller Report, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Corey Evan. Jason Miller will be back in just a few short moments. But first, police in a Mexican border city said Wednesday that a drone overloaded with illicit methamphetamine crashed into a supermarket parking lot. This from the AP. Tijuana police spokesman Jorge Mora said authorities were alerted after the drone fell Tuesday night near the San Ysidro crossing at Mexico's border with California. Six packets of the drug, weighing more than six pounds, were taped to the six-propeller remote-controlled remote aircraft. Moroa said authorities are investigating whether the flight originated and who was controlling it. He said it wasn't the first time they'd seen drones used for smuggling drugs across the border. Other innovative efforts have included catapults, ultralight aircraft, and, of course, tunnels. In April, authorities in South Carolina found a drone outside the fence of a prison that had been carrying cell phones, marijuana, and tobacco. Oh, dear. You can see, ladies and gentlemen, why I'm always weary of drones. But, of course, we will keep you posted on any developments that come up. Is it any wonder, then, why the phrase drugs destroy dreams has appeared on school cafeteria lunch trays over the past years? I always wonder what it meant that now I know. But at least in this case, all it destroyed was a drone. But at any rate, going into the U.S., the New York capital today was again rocked by the scandal by scandal as an assembly speaker, one of the most powerful leaders in New York, was arrested on federal corruption charges, alleging he was involved in a multi-million dollar kickback scheme for more than a decade. Oh dear. This from USA Today. Sheldon Silver's arrest in Manhattan on a five-count indictment put state business on hold, and it led to questions about how the state legislature would function under the cloud of Silver's arrest. Quote, I'm shocked, Assemblyman Barbara Lifton, a de Democrat from Ithaca, New York, said in the halls of the Capitol. Democrat colleagues rallied around Silver. Republicans called for his ouster. Federal prosecutors alleged that Silver, the speaker since 1994, was in a scheme since at least 2000 to defraud the public and use his power to obtain at least $6 million from two outside law firms. Prosecutors said about $4 million of that came in kickbacks from real estate developers and referrals in asbestos cases in New York City. Oh, dear, you just had to bring up the asbestos again, didn't you, New York? Anyway, Silver was taken into custody shortly before 8 a.m. In the afternoon, he was released on 200 grand bail. Amid a swarm of reporters, Silver said, quote, I am confident that when all the issues are aired, I will be vindicated. U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara, Bharara painted a different picture of Silver, alleging that the Manhattan Democrat used New York's porous ethics laws to hide his scheme, allowing him to become wealthy off his position in power. The FBI froze $3.8 million of silver savings from six banks in eight accounts. He could face more than 20 years in prison on each count. If convicted, Barrara said, man, 20 years for each count. You're taking a big risk, Mr. Silver. Moving on to Boston with the jury selection process in the trial of alleged Boston Marathon bomber Dozokar Sarneyev moving at a snail's pace. Court officials announced today the January 26th start date for the trial is no longer possible. This from Massachusetts Live. Judge George or O'Toole was hopeful that the voir dire process of jury selection would move at a rate of 40 jurors a day, but they've never questioned more than 21 in a day. On Wednesday, the court questioned just nine. Sarnayev is, of course, facing a potential death sentence if found guilty, making the questioning of potential jurors more rigorous and probing than normal. A panel of 12 jurors plus six alternates will be assembled from a pool of approximately 1,300 people. If a jury cannot be comprised of the current pool, there is an option to expand the pool to over 3,000 people. 
Sarnaev is charged with 30 counts stemming from the events that took place the week of the Boston Marathon bombings and the Watertown shootout. Four people were killed and more than 200 injured. And it's a small world after all. A measles outbreak traced to Disney theme parks in California led to warnings against visiting the happiest, happiest place on Earth if tourists or their children have not been vaccinated against the highly contagious respiratory disease that has sickened 70 people. New infections linked to the theme parks emerged Wednesday in the outbreak that has spread to five U.S. states and Mexico, though the vast majority, 62 of them, occurred in California. People who have not received the measles, mumps, rubella sh shot are susceptible to contracting the highly contagious illness and should avoid Disney for the time being, state epidemiologist Gil Chavez said. The same holds true for crowded places with a high concentration of international travelers, such as airports, Chavez said. People who are vaccinated don't need to take such precautions, he said. Disney Resort spokeswoman Susie Brown said officials agreed with the advice that it's absolutely safe to visit if you're vaccinated. Thank goodness I've had that vaccination then. At least, that's the theory. Right, that's all I've got for National News Day. I'll send it back to you. Thank you very much, Corey. Corey Evan with the day's other headlines going on across the nation tonight. All right, folks, time for some DC news tonight. And we start off, of course, with the very uh, big developing story regarding Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, coming to uh, speak to a joint session of Congress. New updates to this story as it happened from yesterday. Spokesman Berdini Mitchin cited a long-standing practice of not meeting heads of state close to elections. Yet this being said, after the after. Uh, John Boehner uh, invited Netanyahu to speak to a joint session of Congress. Uh, the spokesman for the president said that uh, that the heads of state, uh, uh, heads of state uh, close to who have elections w in Israel will uh, will not be meeting with President Obama in mid March. Mr. Netanyahu was invited, as I said, to the uh, speak to a joint session of Congress. Excuse me by House Speaker John Boehner and what is seen as a rebuke to Mr. Obama's policy. Uh, uh, on Iran, the U.S. President said he will veto attempts to add new sanctions on Iran. Mr. Obama believes new measures will be harmful to negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. Talks Mr. Netanyahu as opposed. Israeli Prime Minister has warned a deal between Iran and the U.S. will pose a threat to Israel. On Thursday, Mr. Netanyahu, who formally accepted the invitation from senior Republican Boehner, saying it will give him the chance to thank President Obama, Congress, and the American people for their support of Israel. He is expected to discuss Iran as well as Islamic militant groups. In his address to Congress on March the 3rd, instead of February the 11th, as it was announced yesterday, probably due to a scheduling issue, probably over in Israel, that's why they moved it to March the 3rd, but we'll keep you up to date on that schedule. As a matter of long-standing practice and principle, we do not see heads of state or candidates in close proximity to their elections to avoid the appearance of influencing a democratic election in a foreign country. Uh, Mr. Meignier's, Ms. Meignier said in a statement, she added Mr. Obama had been clear about his opposition about the new sanctions legislation. The president has had many conversations with the prime minister on this matter, and I'm sure they will continue to be in contact. Nancy Pelosi, the House's top Democrat, said the visit two weeks before Israel's election in the midst of delicate Iranian talks is not appropriate and helpful. Mr. Netanyahu is fighting a tough election against the Labour Party's Yitzhak Herstong was focused on the prime minister's cooler relations with Mr. Obama. And ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking here amongst, uh, amongst ourselves here at SHR Media, and we've decided when the Prime Minister does come to town, and we have the official confirmation date on March the 3rd, which we hope is going to be the confirmed date he will be speaking to this joint session of Congress, that we will carry this speech live on SHR Media, as it is very important to what happens not only in the Middle East, but what happens to U.S. and Israeli relations as well. So stay up with us here on SHR Media, and we'll continue to bring you the latest as the countdown continues.
to this speech from the Prime Minister to the Joint Session of Congress on March the 3rd. In a House Republican majority often driven by the most conservative lawmakers, the pragmatists are suddenly demanding to be heard. Lawmakers defected on immigration, an immigration vote last week, and this week they forced GOP leaders to water down abortion legislation. With the new fully Republican-led Congress three weeks old, they are serving notice that they will no longer keep quiet as their more ideological colleagues push legislation to the right, demand votes on social issues, or court government shutdowns to try to block President Obama. There is a growing sense in the conference that we need to get things done here, not just make political statements, said Representative Carlos uh, Carrillo of Florida, a freshman lawmaker. He continued saying, we should be focused on the agenda of the American people and not taking on infiltrate amount of symbolic votes that aren't going to get anything done. Most of the lawmakers are self-described conservatives themselves, but with a practical, business-friendly approach and without the uncompromising purity of some on the right, some like Cabrillo were elected in districts Obama previously won as Republicans posted dramatic midterm gains last November. They are looking at running for re-election in 2016 in a presidential election year when turnout of the Democrats could be higher. Now they're behind a new dynamic in the House after years when conservatives in the party caucus seem to call the shots. GOP leaders have been forced into one embarrassing retreat after another on legislation and the federal government had been propelled into a partial 16-day shutdown in the fall of 2013 in a failed attempt to shut down the Obama health law. In part, the cha change is because there are more of the new lawmakers and they say the stakes are now higher. With the Senate now under GOP control, the House passed legislation actually has a shot at making it to Obama's desk. Much of the legislation we passed in the past we knew wasn't going to go anywhere in the Senate. We knew Harry Reid wasn't going to bring it up for a vote, said Representative Renee, Renee Elmers from North Carolina, who led this week's revolt over an abortion bill. Now everything we do has got to be so careful. We have to be so careful about the legislation we put forward because now we have the opportunity for it to pass in the Senate. Indeed, the House in 2013 passed an abortion bill nearly identical to the one that the leadership was forced to scuttle this time around, which would have banned nearly all abortions after 20 weeks. Instead, the bill that passed Thursday, timed to coincide with the annual March for Life, would ban all federal funding for abortion, something that's already mostly in place anyway. As the new Congress got underway at the beginning of this month, conservatives appeared poised to continue throwing their weight around. Two dozen conservatives voted against House Speaker John Boehner in his leadership election, failing to oust him but bo boasting historically high defections. Then, as the Republicans sought to use the Department of Homeland Security spending bill to oppose executive actions by Obama on immigration, conservatives pushed for language to unravel protections Obama had granted to illegal immigrants bought, uh, uh, bought illegally to the country as children, exposing those young children to eventual deportation, which I think is great. The amendment on immigra immigrant kids passed last week, but it did so by a narrow margin of 26 Republicans opposed to it, exposing deep unease among some lawmakers over the direction House Republicans were taking in the new Congress's opening days. On Wednesday, those concerns burst into the open as lawmakers rebelled against the initial version of the abortion bill, forcing House leaders to beat a uh, retreat and set up a new ongoing challenge for a leadership that's previously worried mostly about its right flank. Week one, we had a speaker election that didn't go well, as a lot of us would have liked. Week two, we got in uh, one big fight over deporting children against something that a lot of us didn't want to have a discussion about. Week three, we're now talking about rape and incest and reportable rapes, incest for minors but not for women of the age of majority. I just can't wait for week four, said Representative Charlie Dent, Republican from Pennsylvania. My own view on this stuff is I prefer we as a Republican conference avoid these very contentious social issues. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the, what's been happening in the past three weeks in your Congress. Have a comment about that? 
go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Evan Miller Report, or our Twitter page, at EM Radio Report. I'd like to hear your comments on what Congress should be doing and whether Congress is doing what they said they're going to do. Finally, wrapping up the uh, political news tonight, Medicaid recipients in Wisconsin would be required to undergo drug testing and could be limited in how long they can receive benefits under measures proposed Thursday by Governor Scott Walker, who is positioning himself as a reformer as he eyes a 2016 presidential run. The idea which Walker first proposed during his re-election campaign will be included in his state budget released to the Republican-controlled legislator on February the 3rd. Walker announced for the first time Thursday that the plan would apply to childless adults on Medicaid as well as those applying or, for, or receiving aid from other state benefit programs. While best known nationally for effectively ending collective bargaining for public workers in 2011, Walker is trying to bring attention to other efforts he argues will bolster his resume for reshaping government. He said, quote, with this budget, we are addressing some of the barriers keeping people from retrieving true freedom and prosperity and the independence that comes with having a good job and doing it well, Walker said in a statement. Eleven states already require drug testing of at least some welfare recipients, according to the data from the National Conference of State Legislators, and four states requiring drug testing of at least some people filing for unemployment compensation. But the idea has run into legal problems. A federal appeals court back in December affirmed a ruling that a law in Florida requiring mandatory drug testing of welfare benefit applicants was unconstitutional. And Georgia officials last year put a hold on a new law requiring drug testing of food stamp recipients and with concerns about its legality. Yes, and it seems to be making all the stock markets happy. The Dow's up to 59 at 17.813. The Nasdaq's up 82.98 at 47.50.40. And the S&P 500 up 31 points at 20.63. Even international markets are favoring things all around the world. The FTSE, the DAX, the HSI, and the Nikkei in Japan are all up or breaking even. European Central Bank President... Mario Draghi today adhered to the cliched adage, go big or go home. And for the most part, Draghi was praised for putting the ECB's money where his mouth is. The ECB revealed the details of its widely anticipated stimulus program today, and the only surprise in the announcement lay in the size of the bank's monthly purchases. In a press conference, Draghi said the central bank would begin buying $60 billion in euros, or about $69.7 billion, each month, or about 10 billion more euros than analysts had pr predicted. In all, when the program is completed next September, not this coming September, but the next one, the ECB will have purchased a total of 1.1 trillion euros. Europe has been teetering on the brink of dangerous deflation for years, having never fully recovered from the sovereign debt crisis that nearly bankrupted a handful of eurozone countries five years ago. Europe's unemployment rate stands at 11.5%, and growing in the region is Growth in the region is running at a paltry 1%. The ECB said the aim of the QE program is to push Europe's inflation rate up about 2%, or a level that would indicate wages and prices are rising at healthy levels. If that doesn't happen by the end of the first round of European QE, the bank said the program could be continued. U.S. stock markets had priced in a European stimulus program weeks ago as Draghi and other Eurozone monetary policy leaders have been telegraphing the move for a while. On Thursday, stock program, stocks applauded the larger-than-anticipated QE program, with investors pushing all the major U.S. stock indexes higher. Next up from MarketWatch, Dollar General today announced that Rick Drayling will continue as chairman and CEO through January 2016, or if earlier, the appointment of a successor. The company also commented on the vote by shareholders of Family Dollar Stores to approve a proposed merger with Dollar Tree. The board of directors of Dollar General also noted it is actively engaged in the development of the company's strategic growth plans, capital allocation priorities, and leadership succession, and will provide an update when plans are finalized. And 
Lynn Little, the executive VP of Domino's Pizza, said the Obamacare mandate to count and post calories of served and sold food is impossible. Quote, essentially, we think this rule is kind of a disaster for everybody, she said. The Washington Free Beacon reported, quote, not just pizza, but restaurants and anybody that's going to fall within this law. It's still not workable, unquote. The mandate carried out by the FDA requires that all restaurant chains post calorie information. But that's impossible to comply, the company said. One big problem, Miss Little said, as reported by JoeMiller.us, the rule expands the definition of menu. Quote, we no longer know what a menu is, Miss Little said. It's really hard to imp- ter- interpret. Essentially, they're saying anything that a consumer can look at and make a potential ordering decision from is a menu. So essentially, that could count like TV ads, print ads, anything you receive in the mail. That could make things really complicated. So Domino's Pizza for raising a stink over this, trying to knock over some Domino's in Congress. I salute you. Mm. Yep. I actually ordered pizza from Domino's earlier, and I've been planning this all day. Mm. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that, uh, uh, we don't usually get biased on this program, but today I say to Corey Evan, yeah, good job going for the Domino's pizza. Well done, sir. Yeah, why didn't you get me a piece? We're in different so, studios. I'm but so I can, jealous. like, mail you a gift certificate or something, if that makes yeah. you happy. Yeah, mm. one of the be- one of the disbenefits of being in two studios here in Southern California, I'm in the San Diego Bureau, and Corey's up in the Los Angeles Bureau. That uh, it's just a long three uh, three hour drive. In yes, My unfortunately, goodness. but one of these times we will meet up at the San Diego Bureau, and then we'll go for dinner afterwards. How's that? Sounds like a plan. All right, Corey Evan with the business news. Thank you very much. All right, and as Corey digests his pizza, we're going to take one more one more break here. But when we come back, Corey Evan from tonight, Six Across America. In a moment, cancer changed our lives forever. We were told nothing could be done to enjoy these final moments together. But in that moment, when all seemed lost, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital gave us hope. Because at this moment, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is saving lives with pioneering research and care. We're changing the way the world treats childhood cancer by sharing our discoveries with doctors and scientists everywhere. And we'll never have to pay St. Jude for anything, ever. At this moment, she wants to be in her own bed. I want to be back at school with my friends. I want to be outside playing. Please take a moment and join St. Jude in finding cures and saving children. Visit stjude.org. And now it's time for Lawsuits Across America. The cases are real. All rise for the Honorable Corey Evans. Thank you very much, Pat. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated and come to order. Lawsuits Across America in the Evan Miller Report is now in session on this Thursday. First item on the docket, 10 former workers are suing McDonald's, alleging rampant racism, sexual harassment, and illegal terminations at one location, in a case that will test the company's legal responsibility for decisions of its legions of franchisees. According to Business Week, in a civil rights act, Act lawsuit filed today in a federal court. Ex-workers of McDonald's franchisee Soweva Company in Virginia said a supervisor called black employees, and forgive me for this, they called them the words (laughs) ratchet and ghetto. Yes. One alleged removing her false teeth and suggesting having oral sex with employees. Another supervisor called a Hispanic employee a dirty Mexican and hot Mexican. Forgive me, Bertz. These are the exact words in the Business Week posting. So, it's good to let you know. And, apparently, sent employee 
posts pictures of his genitals and inappropriately touched workers, according to the lawsuit. Yeah, supervisors ultimately terminated black and Hispanic employees because they didn't fit the profile, the lawsuit says. The lawsuit is, of course, sponsored by the local NAACP. The latest uh, lawsuit contends McDonald's had an intimate and intense control over workers at the Virginia franchise, which showed that they were employees of the fast food giant. And, of course, these included monthly visits from mystery shoppers, undercover, undercover company representatives who grade restaurants under compliance with the McDonald's system, including the details of employees' performance, such as their tone of voice and eye contact with customers, facial expressions, exact words used, and assembly of food items. Let's just say I'm not up for McDonald's after this. I'm not loving it. Next up, out of Tennessee from the Star Tribune, a woman visiting an inmate at a privately run Tennessee prison says guards forced her to expose her generals to genitals to prove she was menstruating when she tried to take a sanitary napkin into the facility, according to a lawsuit filed Thursday. Forgive me, folks, this is a gross edition of Lawsuits Across America, but we must soldier on. The woman, identified only as Jane Doe in the lawsuit filed in federal court in Nashville, said she had already cleared one security checkpoint at the prison about 85 miles southwest of Nashville on April 20th when guards noticed a menstrual pad sticking out of her pocket. The lawsuit says that when the guards told her she would need to prove that she was menstruating, she offered to leave the prison or leave the pad behind. She also offered to show guards her used menstrual pad. Instead, she says she was instructed to go into a bathroom stall, drop her pants and underpants, and allow a female officer to inspect her. The lawsuit claims the woman was not free to leave and that the prison visitor policy at the time stated any visitor refusing a search of any type may be permanently restricted from visiting. Corrections Corporation of America spokesman Jonathan Burns wrote in an email that maintaining safe facilities was a top priority. The Tennessee Department of Corrections said it had not yet reviewed the lawsuit and could not comment. The woman says she spoke with the head of security at the South Central Correctional Facility in Clifton the day after her visit and was told that strip searches of menstruating visitors were standard policy there. So it's going to be interesting to see how the courts handle this case of feminine hygiene. But all I know is it doesn't really bother me at all to know that this is what they're saying because... Honestly, I'm not surprised that they would do something like that. And to get even more gross, lawyers for... This is a gross name, Jay. Michael Jackson's mother argued Thursday for a new trial in her case against concert promoter AEG Live, but faced a skeptical panel of appellate justices who focused on the superstar's relationship with the doctor convicted of killing him. Attorneys for Catherine Jackson appealed a jury's verdict, finding that AEG Live was not financially responsible for the singer's June 2009 death. They contend that the trial court judge incorrectly dismissed negligence and employment claims before the trial, and jurors were given an improper verdict form and instructions. The trial spanned more than five months last year with testimony that focused on the relationship between Jackson, AEG, and Dr. Conrad Murray, who was convicted of involuntary manslaughter for giving the singer a lethal dose of the anesthetic propofol. Much of the questioning from the appellate justices focused on Jackson's relationship with Murray, the details of the cardiologist's contract drafted by AEG, and who was paying the physician's 150 grand a month fee to care for Jackson as he prepared for his ill-fated This Is It comeback concerts. The panel noted that Murray treated Jackson before the concerts were planned and questioned whether the doctor's fee would be reimbursed by Jackson after the shows. AEG attorney Marvin Putnam said the case hinged on whether the concert promoter could have foreseen that Murray was giving Jackson propofol in the singer's bedroom. The drug is supposed to be administered solely in hospital settings. Catherine Jackson did not attend Thursday's arguments, and the justices did not say when they would issue a ruling. Two justices must agree on the decision. I can't wait to see what they agree on this time. And on that note, and on that note, it's time to declare today's lawsuits across America case dismissed because I have some interesting stories for you in entertainment. Will Ferrell made a drunken fool of himself at a New Orleans Pelicans basketball game, and it was all caught on camera. From Fox News, Ferrell, who had been... Ferrell, excuse me, don't want to mispronounce his name, but had been chosen to shoot ha a half-court shot at halftime, verbally abused fellow actor Mark Wahlberg sitting courtside, who he said was threatening his family. 
quote, I love my kids, and if anyone was to ever do anything to them, I would hurt them. I'd freaking hurt them, Pharrell. Pharrell, yo. Why am I pronouncing it the wrong way? Pharrell, yo, according to a... Yeah, probably. Because it was in a video shot on a smartphone by a fan. As Farrell was yelling at Wahlberg, apparently under the impression that Wahlberg had once been married to his wife, Farrell then bragged he had slept with Wahlberg's ex-wife the night before, before ending his tirade with, You know what? I don't even like fajitas. I don't know what he means by that. But anyway, after having the basketball he was supposed to shoot taken away by the on-court announcer, Farrell grabbed another ball and pelted one of the Pelicans' cheerleaders, knocking her to the floor. After trying to make a run for it, Farrell was forcibly removed from the court by security. Oh boy, well, you just had to have your angry tirade on the basketball floor in front of thousands of adoring fans. Good luck trying to recover from that. I guess he wasn't satisfied in trying to beat up Diane Sawyer in Anchorman 2. Ooh, making that reference, are you? Right, moving on. Next up from the Boston Herald, So You Think You Can Dance has enlisted a familiar Fox face for its 12th season. Paula Abdul will return to reality TV as a full-time judge on So You Think You Can Dance after spending eight seasons on American Idol, of course. She'll be joined by Jason Derulo and returning judge Nigel Nigel Lithgow, Fox announced today. Cast D... Cad Dealey will also return to host the upcoming season, which will feature a new twist, Stage Dancers vs. Street Dancers. Abdul and Darilla have both served as guest judges on So You Think You Can Dance in prior seasons. Most recently, Darilla sat in for the show's 200th episode and performed his, performed his hit Wiggle It with Snoop Dogg this past summer. News came just days after the announcement that Judge Mary Murphy will not be returning to the dance competition. Of Murphy's departure, Fox, Dick Clark Productions, and 19 Entertainment said in a statement, quote, Mary has been a huge part of So You Think You Can Dance from mentoring the dancers as a choreographer to inspiring fans as a judge. She will always be part of our dance family, and we wish her continued success. First round of auditions kicks off in New York this weekend with open auditions at the Manhattan Center Grand Ballroom on the 24th, and So You Think You Can Dance returns to Fox this summer. And as the movie industry continues to struggle to keep up with new streams of competition, Robert Redford talked about how Sundance 2015 will represent change, a word that he used repeatedly at the press conference that kicked off the festival. And it is going on all this weekend. Redford noted that Sundance, which he started 31 years ago, championed filmmakers who may not have otherwise found a way into Hollywood. Interesting to note that he's talking about change, AJ. Speak of change, I think the cha- it's time to change it up as it's coming to the end of the program, huh? Yes, I digress, ladies and gentlemen. Take it away, Jay. All right, folks, and that will do it for us tonight. On this Thursday, January the 22nd, 2015, I'm Jason Miller. For Corey Evan and all of us here at SHR Media, we wish you a great night. Coming up next is the Exceptional Conservative Show. He continues his series on the finance and Fed tonight here on SHR. Again, I'm Jason Miller. And for Corey Evan and all of us here, we wish you a great night. Good night, everybody. You've been listening to the Evan Miller Report. For more information about today's program, go to shrmedia.com or thepunditpress.com. Thanks for listening. Hope you tune in again next time.